Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Take a Break. I'm so glad that you could join us. Isn't that a beautiful song? His kingdom is unshakable, and he is our mighty God. I know you're out there this morning because I'm told that you're there and that you can hear me, and I'm glad to hear that because it's very hard speaking and talking when you have only a few people, but I know that you're there. Before we get started, though, just a couple of announcements. I just want to remind you that next week is really our special week, and Letitia Russell will be sharing with us. She will be speaking, and we will continue with the Zoom groups after that. It's important that we still meet together and we can share and, and talk together. I just also want to mention that at the end of um, our talk this morning, you can access a Zoom group, and they will be posted at the end. Um, there's just one slight change. Uh, Joanna's group and Sherry's group are meeting together, and I will be hosting that, which means that I will be opening the meeting room. So I need to get from here home in order to do that. So be patient. If I don't let you into the meeting room right away, just hold in there. I will get there as quickly as I can. Anyway, this morning, as I was thinking about that, we can't see you, I can't see you, but we know that you are listening and that you're there. And I thought about in these strange times when we can have access to high technology, when we can do Zoom, is it not a picture of God's relationship with us? He's right here with me as I'm speaking. He's with you where you are in your homes listening. And that's what God's relationship is like with us. He's with us all the time. He's omnipresent. He hears you. He knows what you're thinking. He knows what you're going through. That means he's omniscient. And last week we were talking about Hagar, and Hagar came to the realization that God sees her, and God sees you this morning. And this morning we're going to also look about another attribute of God, Almighty God, God that is all-powerful, omnipotent God. So we have om omnipresent with us, omniscient, he knows all about us, he knows our struggles, and all-powerful God. And this all-powerful God, would you believe it, wants to have a relationship with you. And throughout Genesis, we see that over and over again, God comes down, he reaches his hand out to us, and he says, I want a relationship with you. We saw that with Adam and Eve. He walked in the garden with Adam and Eve. And Noah walked with God. Enoch walked with God. And this morning as we look at Abraham, he has a conversation over and over again with Abraham. And does that not tell you that he wants a relationship with us? So let's dig in this morning to Genesis chapter 15, or 17. And as we go through this chapter, I hope it'll touch your heart. I hope that you will realize who God is and that he will bring you great comfort in these difficult times. Let's just pause for a quick word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we know that you are present this morning. We know that you hear us, you know all about us, and we know that you're a powerful God. We don't know how this passage is going to impact people's life, but we pray, Father, that as we dig into your word, it would touch the hearts of every woman that listens this morning, because we also know that your word is all-powerful. Amen. So let's get started. So chapter 17 opens with um, Abraham being 99 years old. So that tells us it's been about 13 years since we've had any contact with what's been going on in Abraham's life. And we're not sure what's transpired over that 13 years, but I believe that Abraham remained faithful. He trusted God. Let's read the first few verses. When Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. I will confirm my covenant between me and you and will greatly increase your numbers. Abraham fell face down and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. That introduction by God saying, I am God Almighty, 
In Hebrew, that means El Shaddai. And in our everyday language, I think it means God of the impossible. Abraham is in a contact, in a contract relationship. He's in a covenant relationship with God. And as God comes to Abraham this morning and has this conversation, he wants to confirm that covenant agreement with him. These are the promises I'm making with you, Abraham. Do not forget. And so this morning, what I want to do, we've looked at this covenant agreement in chapter 12, chapter 15, and again this morning, and I thought it might be just a good idea just to summarize it in our own words. So let's look at that covenant agreement. It's actually in the next few verses in chapter 17, but I've just summarized them here. First of all, what did God say? He said, I will make you and your descendants into a great nation, and many of you would descend from kings. And then he said, I will give you and your descendants the land of Canaan. And then he said, I will make your offspring as numerous as the sky, as the stars in the sky, and all the people of the earth will be blessed through you. And finally, I will establish an everlasting covenant between you and your descendants. What an amazing promise to Abraham and his descendants. And then God asks Abraham to do something. He wants to give a sign that this covenant, this promise is between God and Abraham and Abraham descendants. So he says, I want you to do something. I want you to be circumcised. Let's read about it. And this is starting in verse 9. Then God said to Abraham, as for you, you must keep my covenant, you and your descendants from Africa after you for the generations to come. This is my covenant with you and your descendants after you, the covenant you are to keep. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You are to undergo circumcision, and it will be the sign of the covenant between you and me. So circumcision is a sign of the covenant. For the generations to come, every male among you who is eight days old must be circumcised, including those born in your household. So why circumcision? Well, it was quite clear there that circumcision means a sign of the covenant. It means this group of people that God is making this promise to, the future Israelites, the nation of Israel, the Jewish people, are to be set apart for God that they are to identify with El Shaddai by being circumcised, by cutting of the flesh, just as the way the animals were cut back in chapter 15. A nation chosen specifically by God, by Yahweh, for a very important purpose. But you know what? God did not just mean circumcision of the flesh. He also meant circumcision of the heart. Listen to what it says in Deuteronomy 12, 10 and 16. Circumcise your hearts also. Therefore, do not be stiff-necked and lo- any longer. I like that expression, stiff-necked. So many of us are like that. Eh? We become stubborn. We don't want to change our ways. And God's saying, don't be stiff-necked. Circumcise your hearts. And then in Jeremiah 4 and 4, it said, Circumcise yourself to the Lord. Circumcise your hearts. So circumcision was not just about the outward appearance, the cutting of the flesh, but it was also the change that had to happen within. Circumcise your heart. There has to be both. You have to have a change in your heart attitude. And that meant a right relationship with God. Circumcise your heart. And then God asked, told Noah that he, or sorry, Abraham, God told Abraham that he was going to do something else. He was going to change his name. Now, I don't know about you, but naming people is often very, very important. If you've ever had a child and you'd had to think of a name for that child, you probably thought about it for a long time. You might have picked a name that was a relative's name or a friend. Perhaps the name would mean something important that you hope would reflect that child as they grew older. Many of you don't know this, but my middle name is Onadel. And you've probably never heard that name before. I certainly haven't. But I had an aunt, Onadel. 
So I was named after her. And as I began to ask questions of my dad, he said, well, Onadel actually was a very, very dear friend of your great-grandfather. So when he named his child, he picked Onadel. And then, of course, it came down, and you got that as a middle name. And I said, well, what does Onadel mean? And he said, well, Onadel is actually um, means laughing water. And I thought, really? And he said, yes, Onadel means laughing water. And so throughout my life, I've had this sense of joy in my life and happiness, and I always like to smile. And I think that I, I, I hope and I pray that I am reflecting that name, a person that um, is full of joy and happiness and laughing water. Anyway, what does your name mean? Does it reflect you? And why were you named the way you were? I also think of a friend of my sister's, and she had a really difficult childhood. She was actually badly physically abused. And when she grew older, she decided that she would make a personal reflection. She would look at Jesus and she said, I want Jesus to become part of my life. And she asked Jesus to come into her heart. She allowed Jesus to circumcise her heart. She allowed Jesus to change her life. And he absolutely did. And from that moment on, she said, I don't want to be called by my old name. This is my new name. My new name is Joy. And from now on, I am to be called Joy. And she had her name changed to Joy. And she reflected this new life. In 2 Corinthians, it says, 5 and 17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old passes away and the new comes. So Abraham... Abraham's name was to be changed, and God said, I want to change your name. Abraham meant, or Abram meant exalted father, but Abraham means father of multitudes, so I want your name to reflect the promise I'm making to you. And then he said, I also want Sarah, Sarai, to change her name. Sarai means princess, but Sarah means mother of nations. Let's read about that name change just for a minute. So we're looking at Genesis chapter 17, and we're going to look at starting at verse 15, and we're going to go down to verse 20. God also said to Abraham, As for Sarai, your wife, you are no longer to call her Sarai. Her name will be Sarah. I will bless her and will surely give you a son by her. I will bless her so that she will be the mother of nations. Kings of people will come from her. And Abraham fell face down. He laughed and he said to himself, Will a son be born to a man a hundred years old? Will Sarah bear a child at the age of ninety? And Abraham said to God, If only Ishmael might live under your blessing. And then God said, Yes, but your wife Sarah will bear you a son, and you will call him Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his descendants after him. And as for Ishmael, I have heard you. So God changed Abram's name. He changed Sarah's name. And then he named the son that was to come to Abraham and Sarah. And remember it said that Abraham laughed when God told him this? Why did he laugh? He could have laughed because he just thought this was impossible. You know, I'm 100 and she's 90. How is this going to be? And so he might have laughed thinking, this is just too big of a joke. You know, this can't possibly happen. Or he could have laughed simply because he was just overwhelmed with joy and thought, wow, isn't this amazing? We're not quite sure why. But do you know what God named their child, Isaac? In Hebrew, wait for it, you know what it means? He laughs. And I thought, God has such a sense of humor that he would name Isaac. With Isaac, he laughs. And then what about Ishmael? God does not forget about Ishmael. And Ishmael's name means God hears. And when I think of that, you think back to when Hagar was in such distress, and she said, I know God sees me, and I know God hears me. And this morning, God heard what Abraham was saying and saying, I haven't forgot about Ishmael. I haven't forgot about him at all. As a matter of fact, 
he is going to be um, part of a great nation as well. And if we read the last three verses, it says, I will bless him, God says. I will make him fruitful. Father of 12 rulers, also make him into a great nation. Does anyone want to guess who that nation is? Any ideas? It's the Arabs. And we're going to lear- learn more about the descendants of Ishmael as we get on into Genesis. But it's interesting that God did not forget about Ishmael. He had a plan for Ishmael. In spite of the mistakes and the errors that may have been made through Sarah, God takes that and he changes it and uses it for his good. And then at the very end of chapter 17, we see Abraham obeying God. On that very day, Abraham took his son Ishmael and all those born in his household, and they were circumcised. And so we have chapter 17, and I sort of think, you know, I was working through this, I found it fascinating and interesting, and I, I loved everything I was learning. And then you come to the point, well, God, what is it you, what is it you want to tell us here? What is it that's going to touch my heart? What does this mean to me? And I couldn't help but think about the way God introduced himself. El Shaddai, God Almighty, the God of the impossible. Nothing is too hard for me. And also, when we say nothing is too hard for me, when we think about um, our relationship with God, sometimes we become impatient, don't we? We think, God, I've, I've been praying for this and you haven't answered my prayer. But I think we have to remember that God is the God of impossible that he does keep his promises, but not always within our time frame. What is a little bit of time for us is quite different with God, and time passes differently. And this morning, as I read through this, I started thinking about the promises of God and how powerful he is, and how we can look back on history and see how God kept his promises. You know, Abraham never really got to see all the promises fulfilled. But we do. And I'm sure you've heard this before, but history is his story. History is God's story. And as we look at history, we can see how God, prof- how, how God fulfilled these promises. And we can look at the Jewish nation, and we can see God's plan for their life. Let's look at some of those promises for a minute. First of all, the Jewish people did not get into the promised land right away. It was decades after Abraham died before they got the promised land, and Joshua took them in. But it was not without a great deal of difficulty and struggle and rebellion and all kinds of horrible things that went on as you read through Exodus and you realize that God was at work in the lives of these people, changing them and molding them, bringing them into a relationship with him. And when we look at the Jewish nation, we think, well, how has God kept his promise with these people? They went through difficult times, and we remember in 15, it said God's going to do a work in the lives of these people. It is not going to be easy. There are going to be difficult things ahead. We know that the Jewish people were taken into slavery in Egypt. We also know from what we read last year when we were studying Nehemiah, that the people were also taken captivity by the Babylonians, and they were in captivity for 70 years. And then the time came when they went back to Jerusalem. And then, of course, when they're in Jerusalem and we start working in the the New Testament, many years have passed, and the land of Israel became occupied by the Romans. A horrible time for the Jewish people. And of course, the temple was built, Jerusalem was literally rummaged and destroyed, and a lot of the Jewish people dispersed. And then we have the time of the Second World War and the Holocaust. And you might just think, you think, well, God's forsaken them, but He hadn't. He has a plan. God had never forsaken them. So let's look at the promises God made. The first promise, I will make a nation. And you would be descendants of kings. Yes, remember? King Solomon, King David, and so many others. They were all descendants of Abraham. And then it said God would give Abraham his descendants the land of Canaan forever. And we know that that has been an ongoing struggle for years. 
But you know, after World War II, something absolutely miraculous happened. Israel became a nation. The promised land, the land of Canaan, the Holy Land. Listen to what happened in 1948. And this was an article that was written. Prime Minister David Ben-Gurion read the Declaration of Independence of the State of Israel. The age-old dream had finally become reality. As David Ben-Gurion read the Declaration of Independence, the new land received again its old biblical name, Israel. Until that moment, the land had been called Palestine, the name the Roman Emperor Hadrian gave them in a dire effort to wipe out the name of Israel 1,800 years before. David Ben-Gurion stated the state of Israel will be open to Jewish immigration and to the coming house uh, and the coming home of our exiles. Only a few hours after the Declaration of Independence, five Arab countries, the armies of Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, Egypt, and Iraq, attacked the newborn Israel to try to eliminate the Zionist aggression. By the grace and plan of God, the new Jewish state survived. God has a plan. God is in control. And then the other promise God made to people of the Jewish nation, to Abraham and his descendants. You will have many descendants as numerous as the stars and the dust of the earth. In 1948, as the Jews returned to their promised land, the population was 872,000. In 2020, the population alone just in Israel was 9,187,000. In 2021, the Jewish population in the world, if you include practicing Jews and those that had some partial Jewish heritage, the population was 20 million, as numerous as the stars. And as we look at Israel today, we see a nation that is often in the center of the news, but God continues to watch over them. And you know, he's still at work fulfilling that promise of the land he gave them. And then what about the next promise, that all the people on the earth would be blessed? Well, you know, the Jewish nation has blessed us. Because of the Jewish people, we have been given our Bible. We have the Old Testament, we have the New Testament, we have the Ten Commandments, which so many countries have used as a basis for their judicial system. And because of the Jewish nation, we have the Messiah. We have the Lord Jesus. And then the next promise said, I will establish an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants. And this is the part of the covenant that was fulfilled by Jesus. This is a promise that involves us because this is where we can enter into the covenant. We can have our hearts circumcised. The new covenant is a promise that was made between God and us. And our promise is that God will forgive our sins because of what his son, the Lord Jesus, did on the cross. And by believing in him and asking him to come into our heart, we can come into this everlasting covenant relationship. Deuteronomy 30 and 6 says, The Lord your God will circumcise your hearts and the hearts of your descendants so that you may love him with all your heart, with all your soul, and live. I have a question for you this morning. Have you circumcised your heart? Have you given him your heart? When we turn our lives over to him and he comes into our life, he comes into our heart, he changes us. And he does that by putting the seal of the Holy Spirit on us. Just as circumcision was a sign of the old covenant, the gift of the Holy Spirit to us is a sign of our covenant relationship with him. And at the beginning when it said, walk before me and be blameless, that's impossible. But it's the Holy Spirit in our life that can help us work towards that. And then I found another treasure that I want to share with you this morning. I'm just going to, I'm sorry if I neglected to show you this slide, but this is the verse that we were talking about and how important it is that we circumcise our hearts. Let's just read it again. And the Lord your God 
circumcise your hearts and the hearts of your offspring so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all, and that all may live. Deuteronomy 30 and 6. And then, as I was saying, um, I have another treasure I want to share with you. There's this beautiful verse in Revelation chapter 2 and 7, and it says, I will also give him a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to him who receives it. We've been talking about changing our names, and I thought this fit in so well, because God is going to change your name if you are in that covenant relationship with him. And he's going to give you a white stone. And you say, well, what, what does that mean? Well, I asked the same question. What does that mean? And so this is what I found out. One of the best meanings I could find for this was that there was a Roman custom that when they had their athletic games and um, someone had been participating and they happened to win a race or they were victorious in the event that they had performed in, someone would come and hand them a white stone with their name on it. And this was an indication that they had been victorious. And then they would take this white stone, which was like a ticket, and it would give them access to the celebration banquet, this banquet of victory. And I thought, that's what it's like for us, that God is going to give us a white stone when we finally see him face to face. If we have had struggles here on this earth, if we worked through it, if we persevered, when we put our trust in him, when everything seems like it's upside down, when there's pandemic after pandemic and illness and loneliness, God is there with you and he wants you to persevere. Don't give up. Because at the end, he's going to give you a new name. Perhaps you will be called beloved. Perhaps you will be called my favored child. I don't know what he's going to write on your stone, but he's going to write something. And he loves you unconditionally. And we have a journey here on this earth, and it might be terrible, and it might be difficult, but God wants to be there for you. He wants to be with you, and he wants you to be in a relationship with him. Psalm 51 and 10 says, Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a right, steadfast spirit within me. In a minute, we're going to listen to a song by Lauren Daigle. And she took um, an old hymn and incorporated it into um, the old hymn, into the new hymn. And in her song, you will hear, Take my life and let it be, consecrated, Lord, to me, a very, very old hymn but so very true in this day and age too that the old with the new is so important. And as I was preparing this, I love it when God just kind of gives me something special. And I think it was on Monday I'd opened the version of version, which is one of the applications that, or apps I use when I'm doing my quiet time. And this beautiful prayer came right up on the screen. And it's a prayer for a fresh start. And I'm just going to read it to you, and when the prayer is finished, then we're going to go right into our music. But I hope this morning that, that God's word has touched your heart, that if you get anything from this, that you would realize that we worship a God of the impossible. And no matter what you might be facing today, um, he is there for you, and he will help you get through it. This is the prayer. I am excited for a new year, Lord and I want to step into it with boldness and confidence. But if I'm being honest, I'm uncertain of what this year will hold, and that you can understand I'm feeling unsettled. Search me, O God. Refresh my heart. Please help me surrender my expectations for this year. Transform my mind as I draw near to you. Search me, God, and align my heart with yours. As I pursue the plans you have found for me, let me remember what you've already helped me overcome. Search me, God, and heal my heart. Whatever this holds, whatever this year holds, I know you hold me. Nothing is impossible for you. Restore me, God, and make me new. In Jesus' name, amen. May God bless each one of you. Amen.